When I was seven, I rode my bike with such speed and finesse that the right side of my face completely rashed off onto the pavement. I've always been known for attempting stunts, but not so much the landing. Hours later, my mother would come home from work to find me still in shock, staring in the mirror at the open layers of epidermis. It wasn't the failed trick that damaged my confidence to its still developing core. It was the scared and desperate panic of my mother's face. Her reflection in the mirror appeared behind me when she saw my face pressed uncomfortably close, trying to grin and bear it. My mother swears by a skincare routine of Cetaphil and lanolin for wound care. So every morning and every night, despite my crying about the pain, we would wash my face and then lather it in lanolin. And if you're unfamiliar, lanolin is made from the fat of sheep's wool. It's like Vaseline, but thicker, greasier, and typically used for chafing or crusty nipples. <laughs> At seven, I wasn't a fan of going to school plastered with a mask of greasy nipple gloss, but <laughs> that's what happened, daily. Elementary school was rough after that. It was the 90s, before self-love hashtags or scars to your beautiful. Kids weren't too kind to the girl who looked like Freddy Krueger, skin gone on half her face, glowing like a car sun reflector. Each time we would wash my face, my mother would catch me staring in the mirror. Say something kind to yourself, she would say. It started as an order and gradually turned into a plea as she watched my focus turn from exploring the world to obsessing over my skin. But at seven, I had already started to hate my reflection. I didn't know who I was, but I did know I wasn't pretty. I knew I was different because of the look of pity I got from adults and fear from kids. The map looking scar splashed the side of my cheekbones and blanketed my cheek before wrapping around the top of my mouth, almost as if the earth had peeled my skin back like an apple, one quick, long strip. We didn't have a TV because that would rot your brain. So over the years, she would catch me spending hours in the bathroom, crisscross style, propped up with my left knee wedged behind the faucet, studying the colors across my face like a watercolor painting of a toddler. I would sit with my glasses almost pressed to the mirror like a TV giving off heat with hot air of self-hatred. Whenever my mother caught my face in the mirror, I saw her disappointed and sad. Say something kind to yourself. By high school, the scar was gone, but I would stare in the mirror and still see the same grotesque, scrawny, splotchy, splotchy once melanin and face staring back. Senior year, I entered a beauty pageant for the scholarship money and won first runner up. It was a made for TV movie that came to life and I was the ugly duckling turned swan, but the attention made me feel like I was still that ugly seven year old half missing face. Sure, other people thought I was pretty, but I thought they were crazy. No five-letter word of affirmation would heal my inner child. This was deeper than scar tissue. I quickly learned there were expectations of being pretty. The beauty queen veil of perfection like Chelsea Christ, the space between her smile and mental illness, the pressures of being alive, the space between joy and grief, self-love and self-harm the space between me and my mother, the emptiness between that, I will never be enough to fill. Last year, when my mother turned 75, I made a surprise trip to visit. It was the end of the May and the middle of the week, and we were on the phone and she said she missed me. I used it as an opportunity to flex the perks of airline miles and unlimited PTO. So I booked a flight before she could hang up the call, and we spent a glorious three-day weekend celebrating her. But I was, as I was packing, she just looked sad. And I knew she was depressed, and living alone wasn't helping the situation. As I packed, my mother was rummaging through old photos. She kept on interrupting me as I was using all my body weight to attempt to close my overpacked suitcase. She wanted to see if I could tell the difference between me and my twin sister. Did you know I wasn't straight? We both look at the picture, two pretty delicate black southern bells with matching ribbons, socks, and bows. No, she laughs. You liked the dresses, but you did want to be a boy for a bit. I'm glad you grew out of that phase. 
We both smile. She finds the family photo from where I was seven and holds it up to my face. You can see the scar looks more like a dark birthmark, hugging my cheeks, fake smile, and two big front teeth that didn't fit my mouth. You should take some lanolin with you. <laughs> my eyes roll. I know I have bigger problems than skin. I'm going to miss you, she said, tears beginning to pool. Why don't you come for Pride in July? I blurt out, filling the uncomfortable silence. She wanted to be invited. But I'm not sure what I was thinking when I threw out the offer. Maybe I wanted to feel wanted, or maybe I wanted her to see that despite everything that happened, I was okay. But I wasn't okay. I was still that scared little girl screaming alone in the wood-paneled hallway bathroom. My mother had never been to Pride, and sure, she was accepting, but only to a certain extent. Homosexuality wasn't exactly a sin in our family. My mother would never call herself religious, more of just not in my backyard. When we were kids, my mother had instilled in us that we could be anything we wanted to be, but I don't think either of us expected that I was going to be a homosexual. My mother's the type who's begged me not to get any more tattoos or identify as anything else until she's dead. <laughs> this is something I'll always find confusing because I've never identified as anything other than queer and female, but I haven't been in a closet for over a decade, and the thought of me coming out again may lead her to an early grave. When I send her pictures of me and the gay boys in matching fits with the caption, slay all day, she texts me back a sad face emoji and a question mark. What does that mean? I'm too old to learn new words. It doesn't take much for her to agree to come. Her only plans at this age are doctor's appointments or dinner. I'm coming for the hot tub. She's direct as always. This isn't about me, which in all honesty is a little insulting given the circumstances. It was 2023, I hadn't seen my mother once, I'd only seen my mother once in three plus years after moving to San Diego, getting divorced and having emergency surgery to repair my tricep. I learned how to use my arm again, goddammit, and I'm only can convince her to come to visit because of my amenities? She agreed, and I would spend the next two months internally rehashing the struggle of coming out. When July came, I wasn't prepared to open up old wounds, but the ticket was non-refundable. <laughs> I forget people don't speak to each other here, was the first thing my mother said when I picked her up from the airport. Someone had already given her the cold shoulder for her kindness. Although she wasn't originally from the South, the last 33 years of sweet tea and Southern hospitality and Jesus rhetoric had made my mother aggressively friendly. She keyed someone's car once for not greeting her at the grocery store. <laughs> She hit the cashier at Wendy's with her cane for asking for ID to get the 10% discount on beverages. I am never surprised at where she lands on the kind but unhinged boomer spectrum. The first few days were a blur of day drinking and drag queens and leather harnesses. My mother went back and forth. <laughs> My mother went back and forth, balancing between curiosity, excitement, and offense. <laughs> Saturday was pride. We did our normal mother-daughter routine, her begging me to wear a bra and more clothes. <laughs> Much to her disappointment, I decided to wear Daisy Dukes, a rainbow see-through rhinestone backless top without a bra, held together with cheap elastic and platform rainbow Converse shoes. My mother wore a black t-shirt that said pride in white font with a rainbow flag. The party started at gossip. We got there early to stake our spots to watch the parade, which means we were drinking at 9 a.m. And she was greeted by a short blonde who whispered into my mother's ear and nodded in my direction for consent before gently applying glitter to my mom's face and hair. The pretty stranger gestured and mouthed, all over? like a gay fairy blessing the day with non-biodegradable, <laughs> tiny shards of light. My mom was telling anyone who would listen it was her birthday. 
which it wasn't. It was July, her birthday was in May, but of course they were buying us shots, as I'm sure you would too. And it was a drunken, beautiful rainbow blur of day drinking with my favorite senior citizen as she embraced the hugs from strangers missing their mothers. I didn't know if I had properly prepared her for the overflow of tequila and love. At some point during the morning, my mother noticed an older 8.5 by 11 woman and decided to approach them. All three women were seated on the swing, squeezed from hip to hip, and one of the ladies clung to the swing chain like it was holding her up. All of them looked red, flushed, and weathered. The lady in the center, probably premenopausal, was chaotically fanning her brow. You look old, my mom cheerfully said. <laughs> Hand out for an introduction. My mother has never looked her age. Her skin, even now, although beginning to droop and sag in places, doesn't wrinkle. And besides a few moles, her skin lacks the fault lines of aging. The seemingly older white women look directly at us, clearly offended and confused. <laughs> what? You look like you're my age, my mom says. And at this point, she's the only one engaging in the conversation. Mom, that's rude. What? I'm just trying to make friends. They're old too. <laughs> How old do you think I am? The lady replied. Her face looked confused and offended. I don't know, I'm 75, my mother exclaimed, excited and proud about her birthday. I'm 40. <laughs> the lady looks to be turning another shade of red. I grabbed my mom's hand and said, fuck mom, we gotta go. The sun is rough out here. I know you don't know, but white people age differently. We start to walk away before my mom shouts back, you should try lanolin. <laughs> my mom doesn't have to pack to leave. She travels light. It's just a small duffel bag with her two rotating pride t-shirts, one of MLK and two pairs of black leggings. She intentionally takes her time, slowly folding each article of clothing before looking at me with tears in her eyes. I don't care that you're not straight or whatever. I just didn't want your life to be even harder for you. Maybe she's talking about the hiding, or the shame, or the bathroom assaults, or being mistaken for a boy during HB2, or how I feel most safe and secure in a dress with long hair. Maybe she's talking about how it won't be simple to have children. After all these years, she's still looking at me with the same guilt, fears, and hopeless desperation. Maybe she's worried about the scars only the two of us can see and how deep the wound. Or maybe she's just remembering the little girl who spent decades in the mirror obsessing over his skin and made hating herself a foundation. Maybe she remembers the teenager who carved love into her arms over and over. Maybe I just wanted to finally be seen. Maybe I just wanted her to lather my wounds in lanolin so we could finally travel to when our daily practice was kindness and my concerns were as thin as my skin. Life's hard for everyone, not just gay people, mom. I wanted her to know she was not responsible for the pain or my healing, that the maturation of scars that took way too long to heal, but I was still unpacking those feelings. I held her hand to my face where the scar once was. It gets better. I want to remind her of all the pain she has helped me overcome, but these are the only words I can offer. I was a terrible mother. Her eyes are full of tears. You did the best you could. It's a half-truth. The words don't sound sincere, but I was trying to accept hers as an apology. If I had known I would have had to be a parent forever, I wouldn't have done it. She's crying. The sun hits the glitter, hiding in the small, tight curls of her grayed hair. A tear ferries a speckle of glitter down the side of her face. And we both know it's time for her to go home. Lately, my therapist has telling, been telling me to look in the mirror more. I look for the scar and try to trace it with my fingers. 
But the closer I get to the mirror, I see how flawless my skin truly is. The mirror is torso-sized, heavy, and propped against the wall on my dresser, so you can see everything above the hips. My skin is my home. Damaged, but doable. All of my 11 scars from laparoscopic abdominal surgeries litter my stomach like constellations telling epic battle star stories of healing. Each incision is a keloid star of mature scar tissue. The skin is bursting at, at the seams. Rough, dark, callous cells raised in excitement to heal and to say, you should be proud of how far you've come. My reflection in the mirror cuts off at my knees, pink and healing, still rashed from skin, trying to show off on my skates a few weeks ago. They have a fresh layer of lanolin. I am reminded that my epidermis will always tell the secrets, that I'm still not sticking the landing, but I haven't stopped trying. I've been trying not to cover up my insecurities lately, so I'm not wearing any makeup. Instead, I wear my high-functioning depression like a cape. My hyper-independence is my sword. I don't recognize the reflection, bare-faced, melanin poppin'. It's been a while since I've just stared in the mirror. She looks pretty. I look at my reflection staring back at me, and instead of seeing myself, all I can see is my mother, smiling. Say something kind. I can hear her voice echo in my head. It sounds more like a mantra. Give it up for Erin Roberts.